Pray for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you for each visitor. We love you. And you know, there's only one heaven. And there's only one way to get there. And it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank God that Jesus Christ is the only way. He's the only one that died for my sin and yours. He's the only one that was beaten, crucified, died on the cross, buried, and rose on the third day. And the tomb is empty today. Amen. Hallelujah. I appreciate my grandson Maddox the other day. He, uh, he says, Papa, I know Jesus, the Bible says, he was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He was three days in the tomb. But Papa, when I count from Friday and then Saturday and Sunday, it's not but two days. And I'm glad that he thinks like we do. <laughs> I said, Maddox, that's good you asked that. But the thing is, the Hebrew calendar, the Jewish calendar, the day starts at 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Jesus Christ was crucified on Friday. The Bible says that he died at 3 o'clock in the evening. The Bible says that the disciples asked to take his body down and quickly put it in a borrowed tomb. I like that it was a borrowed tomb from another man by the name of Joseph. And he was put there before 6 o'clock. He died Friday. 6.01 is now Saturday. He died Friday. He's in the tomb. The moment he died, he went to take care of business, I tell you. So there's Friday and then Saturday. And then he rose sometime, I would say before daylight, on Sunday morning. And what I want to tell you by the scriptures and by the Jewish calendar and the Hebrew calendar, I want you to understand this. Somebody says, well, I wish they would do it like Christmas and let it be the certain day of each month. Uh-uh. Let me tell you, our calendar is off. It's not correct. The Jewish calendar, the Hebrew calendar, is correct. Easter is the beginning of the year. And you read that in Exodus about the Passover. He says, today, when you put the blood on the doorpost in the form of a cross, it will be the beginning of a new year to you. And let me tell you what. When Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and rose again, that's the beginning of a new year, a new life. Old things are passed away. Everything is new. It doesn't matter what your yesterday is or was. It doesn't matter what your past was. What matters is, have you ever come to the Lord Jesus Christ? And I want to tell you something. I'm glad God doesn't pick out perfect people. Amen. If you notice through the Bible, everybody he picked out had a situation that was very, he would be judged pretty heavy. I mean, look at them. I mean, they've done many things wrong. Uh, <clears throat> I'm bad, maybe worse than them, but Paul said he was the chiefest among all sinners. I mean, you know, Moses... Then like the way somebody did something, he just knocked him in the head and killed him, you know. But uh, th then he had to run for his life, but then God appears to him and says, Moses, I want you to go back. Now it's time to get him out of Egypt. He says, God, I done tried it one time. God said, that's the problem. You did it yourself. Try it. I'm going with you this time, and we're going to do it together. Amen. It makes a difference. But my friend, I want to tell you that we're living in a day that's to be exciting. And something I want to tell you, I wish I could explain it clearer, but what I believe is we're living in a time right now that's the greatest time there ever was. Jesus Christ, yes, rose on this day around 2,000 years ago. He, he rose everything is paid for on the cross and the resurrection 
proves and it makes it final. Hallelujah. But let me tell you something. We're living in a day where a lot of people think we got forever. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at my coming again. In the days of Noah, people begin to say, He's, it ain't going to be the end of the world. We've got plenty of time. We're good people. We can teach Sunday school. We can preach. We've got preachers. We've got church buildings. And Noah, you're foolish. You're building an ark and ain't no water close by. And it ain't never done what you say is going to happen. You done lost your mind. Let me tell you what. Noah was right. The Bible says that he was a just man. Noah was. He was the only one that really trusted God, him and his family. What's sad is that Noah was the eighth one to walk on that ark. And that's where we come from. We all are kin, whether you like it or not. We come from the family of Noah. And we keep going before somebody gets disturbed, but we all can. And we got to love each other or we can't make it to heaven. We're going to spend eternity together. You see, God says, I'm going to come back again. 360-something times, he says, there'll be a virgin born, uh, give birth. A child will be born that will be the savior of the world. The devil tried to stop that. He said he'd be born in Bethlehem. And told which Bethlehem it would, would be. He was born. And let me tell you, for 30 years, he worked in the carpenter shop. He did great things. He loved his family. <clears throat> At the age of 30, he was baptized in the River Jordan by John. John said, Behold the Lamb of God. It takes away the sins of the world. Jesus came down to be baptized. John says, I'm not worthy to baptize you. Jesus says, it needs to be fulfilled. My friend, he was baptized. And the Spirit of God came on him in the form of a dove. And the voice from heaven said, that is my son. That I'm well pleased. Jesus went into the wilderness. Tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. It's amazing how many times. 40 days and 40 nights appeared in the Bible. That, that has a meaning there somewhere. But Jesus overcome that devil. He says it's written, man shall not live by what? Bread alone. Told the devil that. But by what? Every word. And that's what I'm learning. To read every word of the Bible. I can't just pick some things out. Another thing, I, it is better to read one scripture and know what each word says than to read a chapter and don't even know what you read. My, God, my God's a good God. And I praise God that today is the day of resurrection. The world might call it Easter Sunday. It's the resurrected day of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus paid the debt. He paid it. Nobody else was perfect. His blood washes our sins away. I want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to talk about something that I've never <coughs> noticed and, and I like that I like to be able to discuss things that I've never never seen or known before that I learned and, and, and this is one thing that I've never saw until lately this clear and it come out 1 Corinthians chapter 11 the Apostle Paul in verse 23 1 Corinthians 11 23. For I received of the Lord that which I also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in what he was betrayed, what did he do? He took bread. He had given thanks. What did he do? He broke that bread and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. My friend, let me tell you, it was more to the crucifixion than we might think. I want you to know that Jesus went through a lot and sweat great drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that was a reason under the pressure there. There was things that he went through even before that. But then the army came to get him and take him away. 
And, and look, he went without food, he went without water, and he had one trial after another, and one lie was told in after another. They blindfolded him, they, they, they pulled his beard and hair out, they beat him, and they said, if you're a prophet, and, that, and one of them will hit him as hard as they could in the face, him blindfolded. He says, if you're a prophet, tell the name of the one that just hit you in the face. And another would hit him, another would hit him. And then they tied him to a pole and beat him with that cat of nine tails, which was a long leather whip with pieces of metal that was sharp like razor blades, claws, that ripped his back hide off, muscles and all. Some of his ribs even got pulled, pulled and whatever disturbed. But let me tell you, no one has ever lived through the cat of nine tails. He did. Thirty-nine lashes. Then he carried a cross for you and I. I want you to know that his body was broken. And Isaiah 53, chapter 53 is a good one to read on that. Also Psalms chapter 22, the whole psalm is a good prophecy on what we're talking about. You can write that down and remember it. Psalm 22 and Isaiah long in chapter 53 before and after that chapter 2. But let me tell you, he gave thanks. He broke. He said, this is my body. His body was broken for you and I. His body was mistreated and beaten for you and I. And look at verse 25. After the same manner also, he did something that no one else has ever done. And I want you to understand that when they had Passover, Passover was a week, but the supper was one meal. And when that, that came time for the Passover meal, the believers gathered together and there was three cups sitting on a table and there were bread. There was the bread and there was three cups. The cup of Abraham sitting straight up. The cup of Isaac. The cup of Jacob. But then there was a fourth cup that was upside down. Nobody touched it. It remained upside down. Jesus took the upside down cup for the first time that ever was touched at this time. He set it up, put the juice in. I can visualize what the disciples' eyes were like. This was most amazing. That cup, when I read it, it's a cup of the wrath of and punishment of God for sin. I never knew that before. Till I began to do each study, each word, and begin to take the, the Greek in the New Testament and see what that cup means. And, and, and let me tell you, the Bible says, Psalms eleven six that the cup represents the judgment and the wrath of God upon the sins of mankind. Jesus took that cup, which was the wrath of God, he put the Jews in. He said, this is a cup of the New Testament. We're fixing to start a new life, a new day. And let me tell you, your sins will and fixing to be judged when he took that cup and set it up. He took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you, and often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, not the, not that cup of Abraham, not the cup of Jacob, <coughs> not the cup of Isaac, but this cup right here, the cup of the Savior, the cup that, that, that took the wrath of God and the punishment of God. When you drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death, death till he comes. And he, and he warns us that we to examine ourselves and realize the seriousness of of that. Now I go to Matthew 26. Matthew, the book of Matthew. First book in what we call the New Testament. Verse, or, or chapter 26. And, and, and I'll start, I guess, at verse 17. We're talking about the resurrection day and what, what led up to it. What, why did Jesus have to die? He died because 
mankind sinned. We were born sinners. There's a lot of people that think they don't, don't sin. The Bible says that's a liar. Every human sin. And there's only two kind of humans on planet Earth. It's a forgiven sinner. And it's an unforgiven sinner. It's a sinner that has come to the Lord. And his name's written in heaven. And there is a sinner that has no name. Written in the Lamb's book of life who will end up in a burning hell that will burn forever and ever and never any relief at all. I'm in Matthew 26, verse 17. Matthew 26, 17. This is the Last Supper. Now the feast day of the or the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples, they came to Jesus. They say to Jesus, where will you that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And see, they didn't realize the importance of this Passover is going to be different from any other Passover. See, the Passover began when the children of Israel, when the firstborn died of, and, and, and death went into every house where the blood was not applied, the lamb died. The blood was put to the doorpost. God says, when I see the blood, the death angel will pass by that door. And let me tell you, the door to your heart, you need to have the blood applied. Amen. Where were you want us prepared to eat the Passover meal? And look at verse 18. And this is amazing. Jesus said, go into the city. Go to such a man. So I guess he described this man. And say to this man, the, the master says, and look what it says. The master says what? My time is at hand. That means something right there. My time's at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with thy disciples. Disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Verse 26. We know about Judas betraying for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. Uh, we know the sad story of Judas. He, he wanted to maybe get things right, but they wouldn't take the money back. So, I mean... Zechariah and other places prophesied that G, the price of the Savior will be 30 pieces of silver and then it won't be accepted back. It will be bought to be made into a potter's field, a place of waste, and would end up to be a graveyard for the unwanted. Zechariah said that hundreds of years before this happened. All right, Matthew 26. 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, he blessed, blessed it, break, break it, gave it to the disciples, said, Take, eat, this is my, my body. And he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink. How much of it? All, all of it. My <coughs> friend, we need all the Word of God. <coughs> we need all that God's got for us. This is my blood of what? The New Testament, which is shed for many. For the remission of, of sin. Look at verse 36. After they had this meal. In verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them. Unto a place called Gethsemane. And you know I think it's amazing. I don't know if you think of it like this. Adam and Eve was in what was they in when the devil came to them and they ate of forbidden food? What were where, where, where they at? Where were they at? Where were they, where were they standing? In a, garden. in a garden. And where is this taking place? In a garden. All right, when Jesus was with them, it came to a place called Gethsemane. It's the Garden of Gethsemane. He said unto his disciples, Sit here while I go. And you know Jesus prayed constantly. 
And if he prayed, how much more we need to pray? He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. All right, notice that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he begins to pray and he begins to be sorrowful and very, very heavy. My friend, he knew from the day of a child what was going to happen. He knew that. Today, as I'm reading this to you, in verse 37, he suddenly becomes very sorrowful and very heavy. Never has he been like this before. And since eternity, remember now, he's God. He always was. Since he's been in the mother's womb, since he was born at, at, at Bethany, since he was in the temple at the age of 12 teaching, since he was in the carpenter shop till he was probably 30 years old, and then he was baptized in the River Jordan at the age of 30, he went into the wilderness and was tempted, and then for three and a half years preached the gospel, and now he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's sorrowful and very heavy. And he says unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. What is your soul? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. What you think, what you want, and how you express it. My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. In other words, what I'm going through at this very moment is about to crush my physical life in this garden right now. Something's going on more than just what we're thinking. He says, watch with me. He went a little further. And what did he do? He fell on his face and he prayed saying, oh my father, if it is possible, let what this cup, what cup is he talking about? That fourth cup. That cup that he picked up and turned up right. That cup that the juice was put in. He said, this is the cup of the New Testament. This is the cup of my blood. This is the cup. And the cup that this is, is the cup of the judgment of God. <clears throat> the wrath of God. Not just a spank but the wrath at the fullness. Let this cup pass from me. It wasn't that he was asking him the nails not to go into his hands and feet. It was not that he was asking that they don't beat his back before that happens and tear the, the, the muscles and meat out. I know that was barren a little bit, but this is not what he's talking about. If that was all it was to it, which is enough, he wouldn't have been this heavy and sorrowful. He is almighty. He trusts his God. But yet, it's something going on right now that's never happened before since ever. And understand, Jesus Christ, God, has always been and always will be. I'm talking about even before the word was placed in the womb of a virgin. He was jillions of years before that. A mystery I cannot understand. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. They three are one. Nevertheless, my, not my will but thine. He cometh unto the disciples and what does he find them? And let me tell you something. You know what's wrong today? We're living at a time that's very serious. That we need to be praying and seeking God. And we need to be in that garden. Amen. But let me tell you what we're doing. You know what we're doing? Same thing they're doing. We're asleep. Mm -hmm. We're doing just like he did in the days of Noah. We're not worried about it. We're just going to let it be. He says to Peter, what? Could you not watch for me one hour? Just one hour. Watch and pray that you enter not in temptation. It says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I can understand on that part. 
Verse 42. He went away again the second time. Now look. Saying, Oh my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. He prayed it one time. He prayed it two times. He came and found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy. You know, isn't it amazing that but something to make you get sleepy when you need to be hearing from God? Are, are, are you, you know, it's amazing that you can be going to read the Bible and next thing you know, you done dozed off sitting straight up in the chair. I know y'all never done that, just me. But anyway, <laughs> verse 44. And he left them and went away again. But look what he did. He prayed the third time saying the same words. That's a meaning. That has a meaning. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established and it's God's will and Jesus Christ, God knows it's God's will that that be fulfilled but let me tell you that was going to be something that has never happened to Jesus Christ before and it's not the nails I'm talking about, it's not the cat of the nine tails, it's not the pulling of the beard and pulling the hair and blindfolding and hitting with his fist and calling him all the kinds of names that's not all of it. It's something even more so than that. What is he talking about? <clears throat> then cometh he to the disciples and says to them, Sleep on now. Take your rest. The hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that betrays me. It's something more than what we think here. Verse 47. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came with a great multitude. They had swords and staves. They had all kinds of military equipment from the chief priests, the elders of the people, the very people that he preached to and talked to. They come to take him. Peter, he decides he's going to try to help me chop one of them's ear off. What does Jesus do? <laughs> I like the way the other, other disciples wrote it, but he says, Peter, why did you do that? And Jesus bent down, got the man's ear, put it back on his head and healed him. Do you see all these miracles, but yet that devil still wanted to make sure Jesus Christ is gone. He's been trying from the Garden of Eden. When God told him, he says, a virgin's going to give birth to a, to a king it's going to crush your head. The devil thought he could win and be the ruler of this world. And you know, for some reason, he still thinks that. But let me tell you, this is good. Hallelujah. So he heals a man. Jesus said, don't worry. I could call 72,000 angels, Peter, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on through with it. This is God's will. Verse 56. All this was done that my, the scriptures might, of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all of the disciples fled, forsook him. Now he's by himself. 100% by himself. My friend, something I never saw before, he was by himself before the disciples left him. And you're going to see what I'm talking about. See where they mocked him? They did everything you can think of against him. Now I go to chapter 27. I'm going to back up. Chapter 27. All the priests, elders, 
that came to put Jesus to death. Verse 9, look at verse 9 of, of chapter 27. Then fulfilled, fulfilled which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying they took 30 pieces of silver, which was Judas, the price of him that was valued to whom they of the children of Israel did value, which is the price was slave. And you find that in Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12, word for word. And they gave a potter's field for that money when Judas was going to return it. Threw it, threw it at their feet. At verse 17, Pilate began to have a trial. He says, I'm going to release to you Jews. Pilate didn't see anything Jesus was guilty of. He says, in fact, everything was proven to be false, what they said. Pilate says, I'll release. And the custom is, I can release a murder by the name of Barabbas. Or I can release Jesus. And I'll crucify one of the two. Which one you won't release? Which one you won't crucify? He said, we want Barabbas crucified Jesus. And, and you see, that's what happened. It says in, they, in verse 35, they crucified him, parted his garments, cast lots that it might fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them and my vestures that they cast lots. And if you really notice that this happened uh, when they began to gamble for that coat that didn't have a seam, that garment, that's when Jesus Christ <coughs> saw his mother crumble and began to fall and weep. That's when Jesus spoke to John and said, John, take my mama away from here now. She don't need to see the bread. And you know why? At that time, when that they began to gamble for that, the scriptures being fulfilled, guess who made that coat? Guess who made his clothes for 33 and a half years? John says, don't let her see no more. It's hard to watch a child die, you hear me? It's hard to watch a child even being mistreated. And that prophecy came 33 and a half years prior to that, Mary. Your son will be the Savior. He will die for the sins of the world, but as he dies, a sword will stab through your heart. It's going to be that hard on you. That prophet prophesied that. Verse 45. The sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. Okay, at 12 o'clock, they went total darkness according to verse 45 in Matthew. Uh, Twenty-seven, and then at at three o'clock, which was the ninth hour, Jesus said these words, and that's what I've been leading up to. He cried with a loud voice, saying, "Eli." That is saying to say. What did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the first time this has ever happened. God the Father, God the Son, the God the Holy Ghost are one. They are 100% in agreement from trillions of years before this and in agreement today. But this is the first time. In fact, Jesus says if you see the Father, you see me. If you see me, you see the Father. Because we're one. We're in 100% agreement. And Jesus says the day is coming. I won't leave you nor forsake you. But guess what happened? in the Garden of Gethsemane on up to the crucifixion. God had to walk away. Turn his back. 
forsake the Lord God, Jesus Christ, the first time ever. And my friend, that's what hell's like. That's what hell's going to be. Some people don't believe in God and don't want God. The day's coming. And you won't have to be bothered with God anymore. You'll just burn. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, today, today's a great day to do that. Don't be too prideful. Don't be too high up. Unless you confess your sins and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you cannot be saved. He cried and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I look the word forsaken up. It means to leave, to abandon, to walk away from, turn the back on. And that's the first time that's ever happened. And it's the last time it will need to happen. God had to turn his back because Jesus took the cup of the judgment of God. Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, the perfect Son of God, the one who has never sinned, took my sin and yours and his blood is the only answer we got. Jesus Christ died. The disciples begged for the body to hurry up and get him in the tomb before the seventh day started, which they didn't have but just a couple hours. And they quickly put him in Joseph's tomb. It was borrowed, it says. And then on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and one or two more are going to go finish preparation of the body because they didn't have time to do everything they needed to do to prepare it for burial. On their way, it wasn't, it was just getting daylight. That large stone that's rolled in front, how are we going to get that thing back? But when they walked up to the tomb, there was a man sitting there clothed in white. He says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Mm -hmm. And Mary looked in there. And someone mentioned it before church started. And what did she see? He's gone. But somebody tell me, what did that napkin look like? That napkin that was over his face? When they buried him, what does it say about it? Folded. It's folded. Mm -hmm. And the custom is, if you're eating, or if I was to go to your house 2,000 years ago, and I'm eating with you, but then I might need to walk outside a minute and walk right back or something. I'll fold that napkin and that says, excuse me, I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. You know what Jesus said? Excuse me, I'll be right back. And let me tell you what Jesus did for those three days and three nights. He went and preached in the heart of the earth in Abraham's bosom mm -hmm. in what we call purgatory, some people do. Mm -hmm. He preached 